Hi everyone, thanks for coming for a Brown Egg Talk with Dr. Kathleen Zizinski. Dr. Zizinski has been studying dolphins since at least 1990. Yeah. Before then? Uh, Wales, well, I did an internship in 1987 in Gloucester with the Yankee Fleet and ACRC, Atlantic Cetacean Research Center. So, but dolphins since 1990. Okay. Um, she is the founder and director of the Dolphin Communication Project, which works to promote awareness of marine mammal <laughs> conservation and to increase knowledge of communication between and among all dolphin species. She's adjunct, adjunct faculty in psychology at the University of Southern Mississippi, and she earned her uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Connecticut, and then was awarded a pre-doctoral fellowship from NSF, which she used to start for her uh, doctoral work which she completed at, the, at Texas A&M University. Obviously, her work, most of her work has been with dolphins. One of her innovations was to develop um, recording equipment to track both behaviors at the same time as sound of dolphins, which is, can provide us with interesting kinds of information. I think that we'll be talking about that today. So, I can talk about, well, yes, don't, today or don't tonight. Don't go too far. Um, this work was, uh, <coughs> Both developing and building this system was recognized with uh, an award called the Fairfield Memorial Award for Innovative Research. She's conducted research on dolphins in Japan, Belize, the Bahamas, in the wild, and also in dolphin area in Sweden and Ger Germany. And she's continuing her work today on both spotted and uh, bottlenose dolphins in the Bahamas and Japan. Um, some of you may be interested that she has worked a lot with volunteers helping to collect data. So who knows? And maybe they're maybe they're what's that? And analyzing. And, and oh and analyze, not only the field part. Nope. Um, and Dr. Dzinski is very interested in education. She's done a lot of educational programs and her work has been picked up by a number of kinds of publications, including National Geographic, Women Outside and Reader's Digest and the IMAX film that we are not showing today, but if you'd like to come to the IMAX theater at seven tonight, you can see the film Dolphins. She was the scientific advisor for that film, and um, that was nominated for an Academy Award. So if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to come back tonight to the IMAX. <coughs> also, she has used the internet to try and help people connect with field work so that she can answer questions for um, people of all ages who connect by the internet to work in the field, and um, she is actively trying to help bring her work to the public. So this <coughs> presentation today and this evening are another um, small effort among her many to share her work and help encourage people to understand more and more about dolphins. Kathleen, mm -hmm. welcome. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you. So if I don't, can everybody hear me? I've got sort of a little bit of a microphone back here, but if you need it closer to my mouth, I'll bring it closer. I tend to, to move a lot, and, and uh, so can anybody not hear me? I guess that's a moot point. If you can't hear me, you're not going to raise your hand, <laughs> especially if I deal with communication. And I have here an outline of some of what I'm going to talk about today because I tend to go on tangents, and I would keep you here for the rest of the afternoon when I know that everybody probably has to get back to work at some point. And what I'd like to share with you this afternoon is just a little bit about communication, specifically communication within and between species, focusing primarily on dolphins, but also the concepts of communication can be applied to any species that you might study, and that includes human beings. And if you want to hear a little bit of my background, aside from what John Anderson has given you this afternoon, and a little bit more about my array, my green camera system, you probably have to come tonight or ask me questions afterward or email me or... or Catch me at some point, and I'll be happy to go into more detail. And also, I brought uh, for you guys today copies of the Dolphin Gazette, the most recent issue, which just came out on Friday. And it will be posted, once I get the file sent to our web manager, to the DCP website, which is dolphincommunicationproject.org. And uh, it's got the most recent results, uh, some updates from our field work, and some other information there as well. And as John was saying, on our website, on the home page, we have field reports from each of our field sites that are located just underneath the big picture on the website, and they are there from the last four years. We leave the field reports there. And we have one extra field site that started last year, and that is in Honduras, and that's a group of captive bottlenose dolphins that we're studying the same way that we study dolphins in the wild. And now that you've seen that I can go on huge tangents, let me get into communication. And communication is important to any society. Without communication, we cannot coordinate activities. It allows us to live social lives. 
It allows us, indeed, to have any kind of interaction with people or with other animals. But language and communication are not the same thing. Every language has specific rules that govern it, Sem uh, semantics, syntax, grammar. Does anybody know the significance of that yellow sentence up there? Or guess at the significance of it? It's got all the letters of the alphabet. And it's just a reminder that whether you have English or Japanese or French or Spanish, there are specific rules that govern language. And there are specific rules that govern, commu govern communication, but it's basically the exchange of information. And we can communicate with other animal species. For example, this is Umi. You'll see her a couple of times. She's my beagle. And she is in play posture right here. There's a variety of different ways that animals, including humans, can communicate with one another. Of course, John, who also is John Anderson, but it happens to be my husband sitting right over here, has a very different way of communicating with Umi than I do. I tend to watch behavior and, and share gestures and other si signals with Umi, whereas John is more hands-on. And even though we can't know every language, we can communicate with people and animals. This is the, the only brief glimpse that I'm going to give you of my camera system, and that's because most studies of dolphins are from the surface of the water, but we are lucky enough to study dolphins in areas where you have clear water and you have habituated animals that will allow close approach. And I am the one on the right. These are Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins in Japan, and we record their behavior and sounds simultaneously underwater. The camera system that I'm using has two hydrophones that are spaced on a bar scaled to four and a half times the distance between my ears because underwater sounds travel four and a half times faster than they do in the air. And so to be able to localize left, right, and center directionality, you want to be able to have that distance so that when we analyze our videotapes, we actually use headphones when we're looking at, at the sounds, and we will watch the videotape and import the sounds into spectrographic equipment and the computer and be able to look at the sounds and listen to the sounds as well as watching the behavior of the animals. But that's something that I would be happy to explain to anybody at a later time. And what we do is we focal on one particular individual dolphin or a small group of dolphins until they go out of view, trying to look at how they interact with each other or how they interact individually as they approach other dolphins. And I'm probably one of the only people on the planet that wants dolphins to actually ignore me because I want to study dolphin-to-dolphin -dolphin communication, not necessarily human-to-dolphin -dolphin communication. Well, as I said earlier, communication is the exchange of information among individuals, any two individuals, and that can also be within species or between species. Dolphins will use a variety of different behaviors to share information, but to give you an example, and I'm sorry, I don't know. Do you guys have sea lions here still? Yes. Uh, if you produce, if any of you are trainers here, you know that there is communication across species when you're dealing with trainers and animals in their care. And there's a couple of different gestures here. Probably if you guys are trainers in here, you'd see more of them since I don't actually train the animals that I work with. But there's a variety of different gestures that you can use to exchange information with other animals, not just with other people for speaking from the human perspective or point of view. All social animals have a variety of ways to share information or to share signals, and dolphins are no exception. They use gestures, postures, behaviors, visual cues, touch, and sounds to share information. And it's not just dolphins. It's a variety of animals. You'll see differences between mothers and pups. These are fur seals in, uh, at our exhibit at Mystic Aquarium. And you'll see mother pup communication, you'll see peer communication, a variety of different ways. In this photograph here, which I'll show you some video in a bit, you have two adult female spotted dolphins who are exchanging a pectoral fin rub, and that's another way that they can exchange behaviors to share information. Well, the nuts and bolts of it, if you're studying communication, there's basically four key elements that you need to identify. You need, number one, a known population of dolphins. We are studying the Atlantic spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. There's two groups, two subgroups of dolphins that we're studying there. North of Grand Bahama Island, there's a group of about 145, 150 Atlantic spotted dolphins. If you go roughly about 200 miles south of that to Bimini Island, you'll have a group of about 70 to 80 Atlantic spotted dolphins. We use photo ID to recognize and identify individuals and to give you an idea of what I mean. Of course, most studies of dolphins from the surface use the dorsal fin, and we are no exception. 
This is number 78. Her name happens to be Hook. I always use one that I can remember easily because I don't remember names. I remember numbers much more easily. We saw her first in 1989, and she had uh, this distinctive mark in her dorsal fin. And we've watched her through the years gain her spots. She's a juvenile in 93, 94, as she was gaining spots along the ventral surface of her body. Is everybody familiar that Atlantic spotted dolphins are born without spots? Pretty much. It's a way for us to get general age categories with spotted dolphins. They're born without spots, and as they age, they get more and more spots. Juveniles start to get spots about the three to four years of age, and usually they start to get them ventrally, and they move up around the rest of their body. She was an adult in 99, 2000, and that's also in the year 2000, we saw her with her first calf that we had identified. And she was traveling with another adult female, number 39, also known as Double Dot. And that was the first year we had seen them with their calves. So we're getting into generations of dolphins that were not only able to identify the age categories of these animals, but also the relationships between the individuals. Besides these two groups of spotted dolphins, and by the way, based on photo ID, we haven't found any matches between these two subgroups of spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. We also have a group of bottlenose dolphins in Japan that we're studying. There's about 165 individual bottlenose dolphins that we've identified around Mikura Island, and these groups seem to be resonant to the areas that, we've, that we're studying them. And in Honduras, the group of dolphins we're studying there are roughly 18 dolphins. And I say roughly is when I started my field season this year, there were 16, and two calves were born while I was there. So there's 18 now that we're studying in that group. As you study communication, you also need to be able to identify the sender and the receiver of these signals that animals might use. And you need to identify the signal. In here today, I am speaking to you. I'm using imagery. I gesture a lot. You can identify me as the signal sender. The, the, the words that I'm using, the pictures, the video, those would be the signals. And hopefully you guys are all the receivers, and you're all at least getting some of the information that I'm sending out. And of course, I have to use Umi as my example here because you'd be very hard pressed to miss when she's trying to get your attention. She oftentimes, you can see her jowls moving and, her, and when she barks, her, she has a little hopping motion that she makes and her jaws are moving back and forth. And terrestrial animals ha usually have some external sign that they're making a sound. You may not always be able to hear those sounds. Examples include the, the infrasound that elephants usually use, but you can get some idea behaviorally that they're making a sound. Well, that's not so with dolphins. They're basically swimming ventriloquists for the majority of the sounds that they make. And they don't need to move their lips to, to make sounds. They actually don't have vocal cords. They make all their sounds from behind their melon in that particular area. This excludes non-vocal sounds, tail slaps, peck slaps, jaw claps, things like that. But because sound travels so much faster underwater and because dolphins are swimming ventriloquists, we have two strikes against us at studying their communication. And that's why I developed the array which allows us a tool to be able to record dolphin behavior and sounds and begin to identify when dolphins are making sounds and how those sounds might match up with their behavior. So we can actually begin to identify the four things that we need to be able to study communication. Well, to give you some examples of communication or examples of behavioral signals and then other signals that dolphins might use, there are pectoral fin rubs, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. There's body rubs, there's hits, bites, kicks, chases. Sometimes whistles or squawks or other vocalizations can be used in, concurrent, in conjunction with behaviors. And we've seen some differences and some similarities between the two wild groups of dolphins that we've been studying, the Atlantic spotted dolphins and the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins. But pretty much we'll look at how dolphins behave with one another and then how they're behaving individually when we're following one particular individual animal. And just to give you an idea of another species, behaviors don't necessarily have to be an interactive event with other animals. It can be as simple as a chin scratch here, as you see in, in one of these elephant seals in California. This particular one was in San Simeon. Everybody loves a good scratch. Well, one of the specific behaviors that we're looking at and to see what the function of it might be is pectoral fin contact, and that's specifically looking at flipper rubs and flipper touches in <coughs> dolphins. And to give you a couple of definitions before I show you the video here, when one dolphin's flipper comes in contact with another dolphin's body and there's either movement or static contact between them, that's what we consider as pectoral fin contact, rub or touch. And we've come up with a couple of definitions, and you'll see these in the lower left here, just the references to them, is 
the dolphin whose pectoral fin touches another dolphin's body we've identified or defined as the rubber. And the dolphin whose body is touched by another dolphin's pectoral fin is what we call the rubby, which makes scientific discussions quite interesting. However, either the rubber or the rubby can initiate contact. So we use rubber and rubby as nouns, and either one can initiate contact. And we've seen subtle differences in the meaning of this contact depending on who initiates this behavior. I'll give you some examples of what I mean. This is a rubby initiated. This is the rubby down here and the rubber. These are Atlantic spotted dolphins, young animals. You have, we've seen in both species, and actually all three, the ones in Honduras as well, mutual pectoral fin contact, rubbing back and forth. That's usually we see in, a lot in greetings between individuals. We have seen reciprocation, where one dolphin, as you can see here, will swim up and start rubbing another dolphin and then receive rubs back. Of course, humans aren't the only ones who play patty cake. And sometimes we've seen multiple partners when they're exchanging pectoral fin contact. Originally, when we had started looking at how dolphins exchange pectoral fin contact, you can see here, this is just a touch. And this touch lasted 23 seconds. I didn't show you the entire length of this particular touch. But when we first started separating out the rubs from the touches, we thought, oh, well, you know, touches are just one second and rubs are, are longer. Not the case. You can have a rub where a dolphin swims up to another animal and just rubs really quick with a pectoral fin and it's less than a second long. And then you can have dolphins swimming for 20, 30, 40 seconds where they're just right in contact with one another swimming along. So after we had documented all of the pectoral fin <laughs> contacts from many years of data, we had to actually go back through all the data and separate it out by time and by touch or rub, the actual static contact or actual movement between the individuals to see where similarities and differences were. And that's where we're seeing some of the similarities and differences between the dolphins in Japan and the dolphins in the Bahamas with respect to how they share pectoral fin contact. And if you want any of the results, some of the preliminary results, you got to come tonight. Or ask a few questions after this particular talk. Well, as with most social animals, dolphin signals develop with age. And how dolphins share information will change as the dolphins age. I guess you could say. For example, we know that all dolphins are born with the ability to produce echolocation clicks. I had a student who was working with dolphins in the Navy in San Diego and recorded echolocation from animals that were a week old or two weeks old. We know that dolphins that young produce clicks. They don't necessarily know when it's appropriate to produce their clicks or how to produce those clicks within social situations or to chase fish. We have a couple of observations from the Bahamas where the spotted dolphins one or two adult females would have anywhere from five to six young dolphins, calves, as you can see in this particular image here, with them, and they'd be chasing horse-eyed jacks. Now, horse-eyed jacks that we have there are, are about this big, and there's no way that the spotted dolphin calves were going to eat those animals. But they would chase them, and they, the horse-eyed jacks would come under the boats and form these schools or these circles, and they just keep moving. And actually, it's pretty fun. If you go down and you swim into the fish, they scatter all over the place, and then eventually come back and, and resume their circle. And we actually have a couple of observations that we documented where the calves would be chasing the fish after the females had done it, and then the females would be on the periphery. And the calves would be singled out. One or two of the calves would be singled out by an adult female and either pinned to the sea floor or brought up to the sea surface. And we're only in about, I'd say, uh, 9 meters or 27, 30 feet of, 30 feet of water here. And that's a disciplinary action that we've seen from adult females to calves. And then the calf, after that disciplinary action, would go back in and chase the horse-eyed jacks and do what to my eye or my ear was exactly the same thing, exactly the same behavior, the same sounds that we heard, but it wouldn't get disciplined. So while we only have a couple of observations, which makes that anecdotal and not necessarily a, uh, will hold up to statistical rigor, it allows us to say, well, maybe there's some teaching going on or some observational learning, and the dolphins have to learn when to use these particular signals. Specific behaviors will change in their meaning depending on the posture that is used to give that particular behavior or to accompany that particular behavior. And think about this in human context. I'm sure that when you guys were growing up, you'd go home, and if, you met, if your mother met you at the door and she had a plate of cookies and a big smile and, you know, arms open, you'd want to go in and chat with her and have a great time. But if she met you at the door 
with a scowl, her arms crossed, and wondering what had happened, you'd probably not necessarily really want to go inside because she probably wouldn't have great information for you. Well, to look at how particular postures might change some dolphin behaviors with respect to their meaning, a good example is to look at play versus fighting. And I have some video that I want to show, that, show you with that. What we've seen is when dolphins are playing or they're fighting, they'll use the same behaviors. They'll chase one another, they'll bite one another, they'll kick one another, they'll use loud sounds, whistles and squawks, they'll have bubble streams. Very similar actions that they're using to exchange information. But there are two distinct differences. If they're playing, there's, they approach one another with oblique angles of approach. You can see that in this slide right here. From, from, the behind, from behind or from the side, very oblique angles. And there's a lot of rolling and sort of wrestling around one another, a lot of rubbing, body rubbing or pectoral fin rubbing within the play action and within the hitting and the chasing and all the loud sounds. Compare that to, to fighting, and the dolphins usually approach one another at right angles or head to head. And there's none of the affectionate rubbing, no rolling over one another, except they'll fight and then go into their own corners and then fight again and then go into their own corners. And I'll explain that with a video, what I mean by that. And it's not exactly dolphins here, but to use the uh, elephant seals again as an example, if you see a bunch of elephant seals just sort of lying around, you probably think it's a pretty placid afternoon. But if you watch their behavior and you see a change, another animal in a different position approach a second, you can get a very different message at least as an observer. I think they probably can get the same thing as well. Well, let me give you some examples. This is a rather long sequence, not long, but maybe if I can bring the video up. These are spotted dolphins in the Bahamas playing. And you'll see where, when the, the video goes down towards the bottom, they'll wrestle over one another, they'll chase one another. If I put the sounds up here, you can hear some of the sounds. We've seen dolphins play not just with one another, but with a variety of different objects. They'll play with each other. They'll chase one another. They'll pull sea cucumbers out of the sand in the Bahamas. They'll chase little fish. They love to terrorize trunk fish, and their little fins are moving like crazy. In Japan, we've actually seen four young bottlenose dolphins pull an octopus out of a rock crevice and pass it back and forth like a ball. I'm pretty sure the dolphins had a grand time. I don't think the octopus had that much fun. Although the octopus in that case did get the last laugh because as those four dolphins suddenly sped out of view, we noticed the last one had the octopus suckered to its face right across it. So, Although we never did see the octopus again, we did see the dolphins repeatedly after that. But you can see the action here doesn't, I mean, the overall feel to it just being slightly anthropomorphic here, the overall feel to this action is it's not really serious. They're chasing one another a little bit. They're rolling all over one another. They're playing. If you contrast that with the next two slides that you'll see, and just to set the stage on this one here, we have a couple of observations, and this is actually, this should be a, a dolphin jaw clap, not a dolphin jaw pop, but it's an aggressive example. This dolphin here on the left is an adult female, and this is a subadult male. We do not know what this subadult male did to irritate the adult female, but she uh, let him know her displeasure. Now, I'll play that again in just a second, but to, to give you an idea, it may not seem that aggressive to what you're looking at, but when it's an individual dolphin chasing another and jaw clapping, that's usually a sign of, of irritation or, or aggression. And I will show you again when there's a group of dolphins fighting in just a second. But the jaw clap that you heard was recorded without hydrophones through a camera housing from a distance of, well, John actually recorded it. How far would you say you were? About 20 feet away. And that's just the noise that that adult female made with her jaws as she was clapping them back together. And to give you an idea, as I play this again, it's less than a second long. It's 25 frames, whereas 30 video frames equals one second. And it was unexpected. We just happened to, just happened to be in the right place at the right time.
the, uh, in, the sound in between that you heard after the first jaw clap was actually his hands on the, on the housing handle, I guess. Then you can compare that to when there are groups of dolphins that are fighting, and you can see that you have some of the similar actions that you had when they were playing, but the intent is quite different. This was recorded in July 1994, and it's a group of spotted dolphins. In total, there are about 30 dolphins here. Typically, where you, when you talk about dolphin aggression, when they're fighting in little gangs or little groups, there'd be two to four dolphins in one little gang fighting against another little gang of two to four dolphins. And in a lot of the literature that you might see on bottlenose dolphins, that's typically males that are fighting over females. And in this particular case, there were males and females right in there together fighting right next to one another. So I'm not necessarily sure of why they were fighting or what they were fighting over, but they're all in there together. The sequence that we observed lasted about 15 minutes that we got on video. And they came into view. We heard the sounds first. They came into view, and we watched them. And they moved around, seemingly ignored us. This is with a wide-angle lens that I filmed this. And they would fight for two to three minutes, kicking one another, chasing one another, being vertical, head-to-head, -head, loud sounds, bubble clouds, bubble streams, a variety of different sounds. And then all of a sudden, it would get really quiet. And they would move off almost to their own little corners. And those pairs or triplets or, or groups of four dolphins would be very, it's the only word that I can really use is affectionate to one another. They would rub one another. There would be a lot of pectoral fin contact between individuals. They'd be very tight in a group. And that's, the, that's one idea or one possibility of where they're saying a different thing using the same signal depending on who the receiver of that signal is. To reword that, to the individuals within their little group, those pectoral fin rubs or exchanges and the tight contact between individuals says, okay, we're still on the same team, right? We're still going to be fighting all the other dolphins out there. At the same time to the opponents, it could be saying, okay, they're still a tight group. We're still going to have to go against them, so we need to make sure that we're tight. Being very anthropomorphic there, but it may be the only way that we can understand what we're observing to document it. We just have to keep learning and observing what's going on to get an idea of if that's truly what's going on between these animals. Well, besides the behaviors and some of the sounds that you've heard, dolphins use a variety of visual cues. We've seen them use S postures, and if you talk to most trainers, when they see an S posture from a dolphin, they say it's aggressive. And indeed, from what I've seen in the, in the wild, as well as with captive dolphins, when I see an aggressive or an S posture from an adult dolphin, it usually is aggressive. It usually is an indication of irritation or frustration or anger. But I've also seen it with younger dolphins when they're playing with one another, and it's not associated with any of the other aggressive actions that I've seen from adults. And it might be that they're learning what this posture is or practicing it to see if they can use it properly as they get older. We've also seen dolphins use a variety of different parts of their body colorations to exchange information back and forth. The younger spotted dolphins and the younger bottlenose dolphins that in, at Mikura Island who have fewer scars or fewer marks on their bodies seem to get away with a little bit more. They can sort of push the envelope with adults and they don't necessarily get reprimanded. I've actually seen a couple of youngsters harass other adults, and those adults, and I've seen this both in the wild and in captivity, those adults that are being harassed, especially adult males, don't go to the calves or the juveniles, they go to the moms or the adult, other adult females in the area. And then those adult females or the moms go to the calves and reprimand them, and then they behave for a little while, and then the cycle repeats itself. Of course, dolphins use a variety of different sounds as signals. There are, as a, there are non vocal sounds and there are vocal sounds. They will use tail slaps, flipper slaps, jaw pops, jaw claps, chuffs. I don't get a chance to see very many chuffs because I'm usually underwater or to hear many chuffs, but I've had people report them from the boat or from captive groups. Breaches, of course, make a loud sound underwater when, when they're using those. There's a variety of vocal sounds, generally two groups of, of two types of vocal sounds. There are the pure tones or frequency modulated sounds. And there are the pulsed sounds, the click sounds, or amplitude modulated sounds. And because I'm a lousy dolphin mimic, I have a couple of sounds here for you to hear. And I actually physically can't whistle, so I guess I didn't need that one on there. But that's an example of one of the whistles that we've heard and recorded from dolphins. There's a variety of different uh, complexities in their whistles. I'd be happy to chat with any, anyone about that a little bit later. 
We've also heard chirps, which are just shorter whistles from individuals. There are, it's not to be confused with potential chirps from pulsed sounds. And screams seem to be frequency modulated sounds that are, that are coupled with air, a lot of air production. Usually those are with dolphins that have a lot of extra air coming out of their blowhole when we match it up behaviorally. And you can see it as a, 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 on the spectrogram as a uh, scratched, not a pure tone, but a scratched pure tone. Then we have the click sounds. An example of an echolocation click train here. Did everybody hear that? That's one. That's one bottlenose dolphin from Mikura Island approaching the camera system. We've also heard squawks and whines. Whines are usually. Typically, we record them from individuals that are playing, especially excited youngsters. Squawks, usually we, re we record those sounds when dolphins are fighting or being aggressive with one another, or sometimes when we've seen uh, a couple of adult males that might be hurting females. They'll use pop sounds, jaw claps, as well as squawks with the individuals. Well, I've tried to share with you a little bit more about communication and the fact that it allows us to coordinate our activities and to share information or exchange, exchange information among individuals, whether that's within species or between species. And all animals communicate, all people communicate, but people and animals don't necessarily share the same language, even though we can exchange information and communicate with one another. And to give you an example of that, this is one of the penguins we have at Mystic Aquarium, and you'd probably not miss the message that this penguin is trying to get across. Without using any sound, just getting the point across. Well, that's what I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Uh, I have a question about uh, we, we often see rake marks on dolphins that we respond to leech and mass training. And I've always wondered, are those always aggressive, or do you see mouthing as part of some of the behavior that you've observed? You show a lot of rubbing. Right. Do you ever see that? We actually see, we see a lot of mouthing during play, especially with youngsters. And what it, what it seems to be, this is, and I've seen this both in both wild groups of dolphins and the captive dolphins. And the question was, We've seen a lot of rake marks on dolphins, and is it only aggressive, or is it part of play as well, or could it be something that's not that aggressive? And basically, rake marks are white lines on the dolphins' bodies, and if you, if you remember from the first video showing the camera system, there are a lot of white parallel lines on the dolphin's body. And those are actually from other dolphins' teeth. And what, it, what, it seem, what seems to be the case is, if it's on a part of the body that the dolphin can get its mouth around, then it usually means business. Like if it's on the dorsal fin or the pectoral fins or anywhere along the peduncle, whenever I've seen that type of mouthing, it's usually when somebody's irritated or being aggressive with another dolphin. If it's other parts of the body, on the back, along the side, where they can't get their whole mouth around the body part, then it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be more like in jest, where they're swimming up and they're, they're sort of, you know, ah, 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 joint. They don't really make that sound when they do that, but you know, moving their mouth open against the body, and they, they sort of get two or three small marks and stuff. So I've seen it for both. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily look at a dolphin who's completely raked up and say, wow, you know, that's subordinate on the list. It gets raked all over the place. It's, uh, it depends on where on the body it would be for my, my take. We had um, the two males down in Honduras were, well, we had a couple of females that were pregnant, and they had one female that actually had twins, and the twins didn't survive. But they were let back in after that situation, the two adult males, because they, they had been in a separate pen. And they, they were like glued to that adult female. They just wanted to be right next to her after the calves died. And there were two other adult females that were pregnant and, and due to give birth within the month. And they fought a lot amongst themselves. And one of the males had rake marks all over his face and a deep gash over his rostrum. And it, it was just, okay, they're, they're mean. And to me, at that point, when they can get that part of the body in their, in their mouth, they, they just mean business. And man, one of the dolphins was nicknamed Frankenstein for about a month because of that. <laughs> it, was pretty, it was easy to identify him. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions? Well, if you do in the future, 
uh, you can feel free to email me. John over here somewhere has my email address. It's on the website as well. And if uh, you have any questions throughout the day and you see me around, feel free to ask. I'd be happy to. Yes? Would you be willing to tell us a little bit about your findings um, in terms of the control rubbing? You said we asked a question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It, can you stay all afternoon? No. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to present a little bit on that tonight. But some interesting things that we're finding, and, and I've uh, I'm just getting to the point where I can run the statistics on it. I've got the data sets all clean, and et cetera. But what we're, what we're using is data from the Bahamas, the Atlantic spotted dolphins, data from Mikura Island, which are the uh, Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins. And because we have a huge amount of data from the last two years from Roatan, we're adding that data in as well. And what we've been documenting is we're looking specifically at pectoral fin contact. Whenever that happens, who initiated it, whether it was the rubber or the rubby, and what the ID of that animal was, what the age and sex of that animal was. And some of the results that we're finding is that, for example, dolphins seem to preferentially choose who they rub with, who they exchange contact with. In both the Bahamas and in Japan, they seem to choose to rub with the same sex, same age category, at least more often than not. And that excludes mother calf pairs because, of course, there's a lot of rubbing between mother calf pairs between individuals. And, that, and it seems to be mutual. The calf will, will initiate and the, the adult female, their mom, will initiate as well. Some differences in, in terms of age and sex. We, hit, we see significantly more rubbing between adult dolphins in the Bahamas, sub not in the Bahamas, in Japan. Uh, Subadults and adult bottlenose dolphins of Japan will initiate and exchange pectoral fin rubbing and touches much more than the younger animals, and it's opposite in the Bahamas. There seem to be a lot more rubbing between the juveniles or, or the calves when they're in smaller groups, say, with an adult female hanging out and maybe babysitting with them. Uh, than there is between the adult animals. And it, there's, there's, that's from the same amount of data from both areas, same sort of observations of the same age and sex classes. We are also seeing some differences in rubby versus rubber initiated behavior. And that's not just between the species, but it's also in terms of possibly related to function. In the Bahamas, we see more rubber initiated behavior, more pectoral, <coughs> a dolphin will swim up to another dolphin and start rubbing on its body. And we see in Japan more rubby initiated behavior where a dolphin will swim up to a pectoral fin and move its body to the part that it wants rubbed. And there's a couple reasons we think that's happening. One, in the Bahamas, you saw it's a nice white sandy bottom. And the sand is actually pretty soft if you go down and check it out. And almost every time we're in the water in the Bahamas, we see some dolphin rubbing its body in the sand. So it's possible that they can use the sand for a hygienic function to get that itch or to get sloughing parasites or sloughing skin off of their body, more so than other dolphins. Well, there's a couple of photographs in some of the video at Mikura Island where I don't know if you, if you picked up on it, but the substrate there is much different than in the Bahamas. Mikura Island is a dormant volcano, and it's about 200 kilometers south of Tokyo. And the entire coastline from, well, from the shoreline to about, say, 200 meters out is all rocks and boulder or boulders, big boulders, little boulders, jagged rocks. Some of them are tumbled from the sea. There's maybe three patches around the island that have sand, and the total amount of sand is probably not more than this air, the area in this room, if you looked at that. And we have seen them rubbing in the sand, but we've not once seen them rubbing any of their bodies into the rocks. Can't say as I blame them. I wouldn't be doing that. However, we had an aha moment this summer, and that's why I'm including this data, and I've delayed finishing the, the statistics on some of this, because... This year, the fishermen at Mikura Island were not harvesting tosaka, which is a red seaweed that grows on the rocks. It's kind of like the fish cycles here in, in, uh, on Stellwagen Bank, that there's a cycle. Every 10 years, they sort of changes over, you know, give or take a year or two. Well, that's about the same when I talk to the fishermen around Mikura Island. Every 8 to 12 years, somewhere in there, the tosaka, it's not enough to harvest it to make any money. So they let it go for a year or two. Well, every time we got in the water this year, we, and, and we saw a tosaka on the rocks, there was a dolphin rubbing its body in it. And I don't mean just, you know, a, a pectoral fin or a fluke here and there. They would start at their rostrum and go all the way to their tail. All the way. I mean, it was as if it was, you know, a loofah scrub or some really cool thing that they loved. And there's little fish, takabe. I'm sorry, I don't know the English word for takabe. But they're little, cool, they taste really good, little small fish. And the dolphins would eat them, and they'd hang out among the, the tosaka as well. And so I think this year there will be less rubby-initiated behavior at Mikura Island because they can actually use part of the environment to, to help with a certain function that pectoral fin rubbing might have when it's rubby-initiated. 
um, but that's waiting out. And I actually have a couple of volunteers helping process that data, but I haven't told them my ideas because I don't want to bias them for looking for something. So I was like, just process this data really quick, and you know, I'll do some of it, but I don't want to, I don't want to jinx or, or bias them on what they're doing. Uh, we've also seen some other differences. For example, the Rub E will have more varied postures when it initiates a particular behavior or, or swims up to another dolphin. It will be upside down on its side, left or right side. It'll be, uh, you know, head down as it swims towards another dolphin, whereas the rubber will be more horizontal more often than not. And that holds true for both, ind both individuals. From Roatan, as we're processing some of that data, we've seen less pectoral fin to pectoral fin rubbing. We've seen some of it, but it seems to be much less than from the two wild groups of dolphins, which would sort of make sense because if you see pectoral fin to pectoral fin rubbing more in a greeting behavior, it wouldn't necessarily have to greet each other all the time. I mean, they can get out of each other's view, but they don't necessarily have to, you know, they know they're there. They don't have to greet them each time or, or if they're separated and come back together. So I could go on, but I probably should, <laughs> probably should see if there's any other questions. Yes. <laughs> I'm just wondering about your S posture that you have, the, the description of that. Mm -hmm. um, is the tail always in an up or down position for that, or could it be one or the other? I, I missed it if there was a photograph of that. I didn't, I didn't have the photograph in there. I have video of it, but I didn't pull that video out. Uh, you know, I haven't looked at it in terms of if the tail is always up or always down. I, I know that there's always, the body always looks like a strange S. Yeah. And, if the head is usually down, up, down, up, the tail, I guess, would usually be up, but it's something I'd have to look at and double check. I, I never looked at it for that. Um, have you seen it differently? No, I, I've seen it, but I, I didn't, I never really realized that there was a name for it. Um, and mm -hmm. I saw actually, we had a mother and calf pair here that we rehabbed one year, and uh, the calf was just really doing some crazy things, and you could actually see the mother begin it it may have been a way for her to indicate to the calf to knock it off yeah. to not what I've seen a lot of times and I think this may be completely unfounded idea and not not really testable but when we've seen that aggressive activity of groups of dolphins and they fight, and I've seen this in Japan and in the Bahamas, that just happens to be the best video that I have of it, is it's never a solid bit of aggression for 10 or 15 minutes. It's always aggression spaced with a separation. And I wonder sometimes if that's a way for them to get a message across using actual aggressive actions or using posturing and gesturing so that, I mean, Dolphins can kill one another. They can, they can, you know, tail slap or ram or, or, you know, there's many cases of infanticide and of, of just ramming. And so they probably know, going really out on a tangent, they probably know that they can inflict that kind of serious damage. And if it's not that much, if it's just fighting over something in their social setting or in the environment, they don't necessarily have to use the aggressive force that could kill someone. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that may be why they're, they alternate that back and forth. I actually, there was one thing I did see in Honduras last year that I had never seen before, which just, it, it, it dumbfounded me because dolphins can make loud sounds, and I'm sure most of you know that with their tails, they can make tail slaps at the surface, and it's pretty loud, even if you're underwater. And, and I was underwater, and I was watching this female, and she was about, I think last year she was four years old, and her name was Taylor. And this was in Honduras, and she was a good meter down from the surface, and she was a couple meters up from the bottom, and she was not near anything. And I was I was happened to be watching her at the time, and she cavitated the water, and she just tail slapped in the middle middle of the water column, and there were air bubbles coming off of her tail, and she did it twice, and I recorded it, and the sound was really loud, and I have it on there, and I just I would have if I hadn't seen that. I would have thought, oh, well, you know, somebody breached or tail slapped or somebody did a, a jaw pop, but it was just her tail. And I don't, I, I mean, she was by herself. I don't know if she was just, you know, having a little fit or upset or just playing. I mean, she wasn't near anyone, wasn't aggressively posturing or wasn't in an S posture, just, 
Maybe she was just doing it. Ah, let's see if I can do this. You know, I, I don't know, but it was. I've never seen that in the wild. And the other thing is, we have for our return on effort in the field in the Bahamas. We have about a one to five percent return on effort. If you're north of Grand Bahama Island in the on the White Sand Ridge area, it's about a one percent return on effort. If you're around Bimini, it's about five percent because north of Grand Bahama Island, we're boat based. Around Bimini, we're land based, and we go out for short times. So the dolphins are seen more close to land. At, in Japan, we had our best field season ever, and we had this summer, and we had a 19.5 percent return on effort in terms of the amount of time spent looking for dolphins and actually the video that was gathered that we used for observation. And contrast that with Roatan, which is where we study that group of captive dolphins, and there's a 90 percent return on effort. I mean, we're in the water for 30-minute sessions or 60-minute sessions. And pretty much when we record 30 minutes or 60 minutes, we have dolphins in view for just about most of that time. Of course, none of the wild dolphins have put their rostrum on my lens and pushed, whereas a couple of the dolphins in Roatan have. And I have to remove myself from the water because I'm not their play toy. And they, we've gotten them to realize it takes about four days, four or five sessions of being in the water when I go back to Roatan to get them to realize that I'm not like the other split fins. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to hang out. When I have this green thing in the water, I don't make eye contact. I don't. I watch them and I follow them, but I don't interact. I don't. I've never touched the dolphins there during any kind of observation session. And whenever that green thing is there, that's it. I, I, it's just watching, and they seem to get it, except when they're in the mood to play. Yes. Have you seen any correlation between actual uh, vocalizations and actions, as in like they're signaling to each other before the action actually happens? Have we seen any correlation between behaviors and their sounds or, um, you know, a precursor or following suit for, for the sounds? Not anything that is a specific sound only to a specific action. Uh, because when we've recorded their sounds, we've some of the sounds that I've recorded, um, to give an idea of click trains and, and short whistles, I've recorded them during play. I've recorded them during uh, traveling, during low-level social activity. What we have seen is uh, if the dolphins are going to come together, when they're, when they're coming together after separation in time or space, almost like a greeting behavior, if there's no uh, frequency modulated sound, no chirps or no short whistles produced after an echolocation click train, more often than not, there's physical contact. So there'll be pectoral fin rubbing or body rubbing. And if there's a, a, the click train as dolphins approach and then there's some frequency modulated sound produced, then there's usually no physical contact. And that's usually the case for those two different types of greening behaviors. Uh, squawks, yes, we usually see them when dolphins are in rambunctious or heightened play where there's a lot of fast moving and chase activity. Uh, we've also seen them when there's aggression, when the dolphins are fighting with one another. And I've seen the only, the only it's, it's sort of an action pattern is when, when I've seen adult males corral and chase females, adult females, and, and after this chasing and these pop behaviors and, and uh, rake marks and et cetera, there's been copulation. So these are all maybe what they call courtship behaviors or just corralling behaviors or, her, you know, I, I would call it harassing, but that's just my perspective on it. Uh, but we've seen some of those. We, one of the students that I was advising looked at vocal or non-vocal communication in both the spotted and the bottlenose dolphins and was looking at at patterns in behavior and looked at certain target behaviors and looked at three behaviors, one, two, and three behaviors before and one, two, and three behaviors after and didn't find any significant patterns. So I'm, I tend to think that dolphins don't necessarily have a language like English or Japanese. I think more that they would have a vocabulary that includes gestures and postures and sounds and behaviors and that they vary based on context or what's going on between individuals. So. Sort of yes and no. Kathleen, <coughs> thank you. I think we should wrap up because I know some people need to go back, but if you have other questions, just stay for a few minutes. Thanks so much. Thank you. And there's newsletters here if anybody wants any. Help yourself. There's there's a, a few and I can send more up. <laughs>